Many of you knew that during this summer, I made a trip to to England, and uh, many had asked me about different aspects of the trip and to talk about little things there. And I thought it most fitting today to start off talking a little bit about that, because during that trip, I was fortunate enough to be able to go to the town of Lincoln and to go to the cathedral church there and to pray at the tomb of St. Hugh of Lincoln and of little St. Hugh for all of you here, for all, for the good of our church, for the good of everything that we do here and for the benefit of souls. And it was interesting when I coming into that town. The whole town of Lincoln is set up much as it would have been a long time ago. All the old buildings are still there and they're lined by these narrow cobblestone streets and there's an old castle at which the king would stay. In fact, today it's the home of one of the original copies of the Magna Carta. And rising high above it all is the massive Gothic cathedral of Lincoln. And it really is just that. It's huge. It stands out above all the rest because it's on one of the highest points of the town, and it's at the center of the town, and it is by far the tallest building in the town. In fact, during its day, it was the tallest building in the world from 1311 all the way to 1548, uh, when the tall middle spire ended up uh, collapsing due to, to fire in 1548. But for that time, almost 200 years, it was the tallest building in the world. And around that city is a very rural landscape of farmland and rolling hills, and you can see the church as you're approaching the town from far away whenever you have a clear line of sight. In fact, I was coming in at night time and it was underlit by, by floodlights and you could see it. It was magnificent from such a far distance as you would come in. And I couldn't help but think as I approached that town that that sight, in the daylight anyways, would have been a very similar sight as to what St. Hugh himself, our patron, would have witnessed when he approached Lincoln for the very first time. St. Hugh, for his part, was born in Avalon in France about the year 1135. And his mother died when he was only eight years old. His dad was a soldier, and he couldn't both care and educate the boy at home and take care of his duties as a soldier. And so he always, loving his son very much and wanting him to have the best of educations and the best of spiritual upbringing, he sent him off to board at a monastic school. And at that school, he, uh, St. Hugh applied himself very aptly, and he, and, he, and he worked very hard, and his life was filled with lots of prayer, lots of hard work, lots of study, very little in the way of recreation, as he was surrounded completely by uh, true cloistered men, monks, and uh, while it would have crushed other people, St. Hugh thrived in it. He loved the monastic life and soon entered the monastery as a novice, eventually being ordained to the priesthood. And then in his 20s, after having made a journey to uh, for a, a visit to the, the Grand Chartreuse, the, the Carthusian monastery in the, uh, the mountains of France, he longed to actually live there. And so he left the Benedictines and, and became a Carthusian, was accepted into the order, and for ten beautiful years spent his time in quiet and in prayer in that monastery. But as it would have it, being that he was extremely pious and extremely uh, well-learned, he was soon called away from his little sanctuary of Chartreuse. <coughs> And he was called to, to England, a place he had never been before, because there the first Carthusian monastery was being established in the town of Witham in England. Henry II, who was king at that time, he, for his part, had uh, promised as part of his penance for having put to death 
St. Thomas of Becket to establish a Carthusian monastery. And so that very first monastery, its first prior was to be another saint, St. Hugh of Lincoln. He arrived there and would, as it said, built up not only the building, but the souls there by hand. He would uh, go around talking with all the people oftentimes and setting that really good example and helping out the poor and the, and the workers uh, so faithfully that he won over many of the nobles who were very much against the establishment of that monastery because they saw the Carthusian order and they thought, oh no, here comes another order and this one is extremely strict. And this one is going to be something, some sort of hardship on our land. And they, and they and they're bucked against it at first. But then when they would see Hugh there carrying boulders for the foundation of the church himself and mixing mortar by his own hands and giving of his meager possessions to the poor and taking care of the sick, they couldn't help but fall in love with all that he did. And so soon... The, the numbers of monks increased very rapidly. He built up this grand monastery of a grand religious order there in Witham. Well, with that, after being there for a while, he soon was appointed to be the next bishop of Lincoln uh, in 1184. The see had been vacant for two years as Henry II sort of enjoyed in collecting the money that was due to the bishop's place without having to fill somebody in there, but he knew he couldn't do that forever, and so he had to put somebody in there. He was very impressed by the the prior of, of Witham and put, put him into the spot of bishop. And there he served faithfully to the end of his life, oftentimes having to take a stand against that very same king and his successors um, in order to protect the rights of the church and in order to protect the rights and to support the poor and the working people of his flock until he finally died in the year 1200. One of the most remarkable things about St. Hugh's life was not necessarily all of the external actions that we often think about, but it was the interior part of the man. That's what made him a saint in the end. Yes, all those works of charity were part of what built him up as that great saint in the eyes of the church, but ultimately it all came down to the true point of charity, the point of love, the interior love of God above all else. That's what St. Hugh possessed so greatly and exercised so regularly. He was constantly placing himself consciously in the presence of God, meditating upon and thinking about how God was always with him, always there to assist him, always there to aid him in everything that he needed to do. And it was that that, that saw him through so many trials and difficulties in life. It was all done for the love of God. In his early time as a novice, at the beginning of his religious vocation, as his vocation was being tried, he was oftentimes faced with great temptations, interior temptations, temptations against his very vocation itself. And as he would struggle through these things, it was that one constant thought that would see him to the end. He always brought his mind back to the presence of God with himself. Ultimately, that type of life, being constantly mindful of being in the presence of God, constantly mindful of the love that you have for God in your service and all the works that you do and all the efforts that you make throughout the day, that it's done for that solitary purpose, the love and service of God, that cannot help but be noticed by other people around you. That cannot be helped, but to make a an impression on people, to set you apart as a little bit different than those that you see elsewhere. And that constant knowledge of being with God is just that that made the impression 
upon King Henry II that led to Hugh's appointment as Bishop of Lincoln. He had impressed Henry II very much as prior in his prudence and his work and all the things that he did and just his piety. Henry was drawn to him. Even he couldn't put a finger on to why, but he but he knew that he was special. And yet, with all that level of being impressed, for two years he left that see <coughs> vacant. Until finally, a great instant happened. Henry the Second was on a boat coming back from France, and uh, from um, on his way from Normandy to England, a great storm rose up causing the ship to be bounced all over the place, and it looked for sure that they would perish in that storm. And at that, when it seemed that all hope was lost, that certainly they were going to die, Henry, King of England, found himself upon his knees, on the ship, on the deck, looking to heaven, pleading with God. And he cried out with that instinctual cry, that is not premeditated, but goes right down to the very core. He cried out, O God, whom the prior of Witham serves, by his merit and intercession, save me. He asked for Hugh, still living, to be the intercessor on his behalf to God, to save him from peril. And with that, the storm Calm, the winds subsided a bit, and the waves settled, and the ship was saved. They made their way back to port, and at that instant, Henry knew he had his man, he had his bishop for Lincoln. It had to be Hugh. In life, we feel so often like Henry the Second. We are tossed about to and fro, were assailed by a great storm, a storm of life. The waves of temptation batter us. The winds of duty push us one way or another. The concern of perishing ourselves or the worry of the fate of those dear to us consumes us at times. So what do we do? What recourse do we have? We have to cry out for help. We have to cry out to that same Lord for aid. Seek the same aid of that same intercessor, our patron here, St. Hugh of Lincoln. And like St. Hugh, it's by constantly placing ourselves in the presence of God that we are able to find our way through whatever trials come to us. During 40 hours, this is more than merely just that conscious knowledge that God is always with us. But rather, he calls us here to our knees, to be before him physically in that presence, true presence, in the blessed sacrament. And we come, and we see him, and he sees us. And we take all these troubles, and worries, and burdens of life, and we lay them, place them at his feet, at Christ's feet, to help us. And in then, in that moment, we gaze upon our God in adoration. And we ask him, save us. Help us. I want to love and serve thee like thy faithful servant, Saint Hugh. And you alone can help me. How could he ever refuse such a humble and sincere plea on our part? And like that storm on the sea, the winds of duty will not die, but they will ease. And the waves of temptation, they won't disappear, but they will become navigable. And we are filled with the knowledge and the confidence that I am not alone in my journey in life. And I'm not by, I'm not helpless, but God is there with me always 
and with him I shall not perish. This little church here is our ship, and in its walls we may always find that shelter from the storm of life. And all we need to do when we're troubled is to look up and we see our captain there on high, and he always guides us to the safe harbor of heaven. May God bless you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. Amen.